Okay, so um, we're going to get started. My name is Barney Rosenberg. Okay, the judges introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Zoe Ang. I'm from the Ethics and Compliance Commission. I'm Barney Gitti Klaus. I'm also from the Ethics and Compliance Commission. Hi, I'm Ned Johnson. I'm with Credential, and I'm in the Global Business Ethics and Integrity Office. Okay. So, first order of business. Anybody who has a cell phone, turn it to stun, turn it off, and that way everybody will get um, a chance. And I am required by law in Louisiana to read the following statement to you. Uh, it's really about the ethics program, the competition. So in this part of the competition, you're taking on uh, a fictional business identity and assigning a fictional identity to us as the judges. And you'll let us know what that is. Uh, make sure everybody uh, knows who you are and who we are supposed to be before we get started. Uh, you'll have 25 minutes, plus or minus five minutes, about 30 minutes for your presentation to describe the legal, financial, and ethical aspects of uh, your case. Uh, during this time, uh, we're not going to interrupt you with questions. We'll wait until you've done your presentation. When you're finished, we're going to ask you questions for about 20 minutes. We'll stay in character, and so we'll do. So whatever okay. rules we have. I don't know that. Okay. Um, I will probably ask the first question and then turn it over to the other judges. When all of that is done, the presentation and the questions and answers, we'll pause, we'll all take a deep breath, and then we can do some feedback. Um, we'll tell you our impressions of your presentation. You're allowed to ask us questions too. It's a conversation. Um, some things to keep in mind. Uh, the ethical aspects of your uh, analysis are the most important. Uh, and they should be described in simple, practical, common sense terms that, that even the likes of us can understand. Uh, don't use technical philosophical terminology uh, or base your arguments on religious or theological grounds. That's not what this is about. That will be considered a serious weakness if you do that. Uh, any members of the team reading your parts not a good thing to consider mistakes. So talk to us. Uh, but you can use notes. And during the presentation, every member should have a speaking part. So I've got a timer. I'm going to set it at 30 minutes, and we're going to start now. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. We are in the Lima Consulting Group here talking to Jai Leeds Board today in terms of the hepatitis C and disability treatment. Your well-known blockbuster drug, uh, 1,000 pill a day. We are coming in. I'm, I'm going to be your industry expert today. I'm Nina from Germany. I have Jan with me, who is your ethical compliance expert from China. Then I have Julian coming in from Belgium, being the legal expert in our team. And I have Mengi, who is the business expert, coming in from China as well. So let's get started. Finding a balance of being a good corporate citizen and making good returns for your shareholder is very hard today. The company that has invested hundreds of million dollars into researching a new drug wants that money back. So Jay Lead is walking a very fine line when having patients who need the new drug and can't afford the whole price. And on the other side, having society's desire to have pharmaceutical companies continue researching and finding new treatments. We start with a statement from Paul Farmer. He's a pretty well-known physician and humanitarian who's teaching at Harvard Medical Care, at Medical School, I'm sorry. And he states that he can't find any argument for anyone to have a right to health care. But he can argue that every people has the right to treat a disease and to get a cure for that disease if we have a cure on the market. So let's see what we came up with for you. First, we're going to talk about the hepatitis C virus. So just a quick reminder what we are actually dealing about. Then we have Jilet's breakthrough, the blockbuster drug. We will get into the legal perspective of the patent law within the US. Then we will have a quick view on the business strategy 
the pricing strategy, the class action suit. We will come to that. And the industry perspective. And finally, we will give you some recommendations how to deal with the situation. So let me start with what is HCV. HCV is known as hepatitis C. It's a blood-borne liver disease, which is actually the virus is called HCV, which is, which is hepatitis. We have six genotypes within HCV, um, but we are not focusing on the genotypes here. So who is actually in danger of getting this disease? First of all, we have injection drug users. So everybody who uses it, drugs and puts a needle in their veins could, might have HCV. And then we have the baby boomers. This is very interesting because they actually got blood transfusions during their time, probably. And um, since HCV is transmitted over the blood exchange, they are actually in danger to have HCV today. So what is the result of that? And we have out of 100 people who are actually infected with HCV, that doesn't mean that you develop any symptoms. It can, the virus can stay in your blood without giving you any trouble, without developing any symptoms. You can actually live with that. But out of 100 people who are infected, 70 to 85% will develop a chronic infection. And that's what we are talking about here. Somebody who's living the rest of the life with that disease. Out of those, 60 to 70% will develop a chronic liver disease. And out of that, up to 20 will develop liver cirrhosis. Liver cirrhosis, we can see this on the right side. Well, uh, the liver looks pretty bad. It's pretty damaged. It's like falling apart, it's not functioning very well anymore, and you get a serious problem when you're in that stage. Up to 5% actually die from liver cirrhosis because it's liver cancer, it's pretty well known as liver cancer, and if you don't get a treatment or if you don't get a new liver transplant, which is pretty hard to score right now on the market, since like 33,000 HCV patients only in the US are waiting for a new liver. So you have to get in line and get a new liver. So, um, and let's see the symptoms, why it's actually pretty hard to diagnose HCV today, because you have a very um, long incubation um, time. We are talking here up to two years. So you can live with the disease for two years and not develop any symptoms. I will pass over to my ethical expert, John, Who's giving Thank you a little prelude? So, uh, an estimated number of 150 million people are currently suffering hepatitis C throughout the world. And uh, 3.2 million of the people are actually living in the United States. So, here we have the socioeconomic class issue, which is within the 3.2 million people, most of the patients here are actually come from the low income families. So which means they, have, they don't have the money to buy the medicine and they can't afford the treatment. So most of the patients, they're actually excluded from this treatment. So the current situation is that the life-saving treatment is too expensive for the US citizens. Now, do we have the uh, difference between old treatment and the current treatment? Yes, we do. Uh, we have comparison here. As you can see, in the old treatment, the dropout rate is about 50%. And for current treatment, is drop, the dropout rate is uh, less than 8%. So the treatment, for the old treatment, the patients have to take the medicine as long as the symptom remain in the body. And for the current treatment, it's only 12 to 24 week treatment, only taking pills. And there are a lot of side effects, such as chest pain, fatigue, depression, by using the old treatment. But in the current treatment, there are almost no side effects. And the success rate for old treatment is 10 to 20%. And for current treatment, it's only the success rate is above 90%. So here, uh, we have uh, Galiz breakthrough. Uh, the new treatment is called a Sovati. So with an effective 
cure rate of over 90%, so that is a major breakthrough because it doesn't require the patient to receive liver transplant to recover fully. Now I'm gonna pass over to my colleague, Julian. Okay, so um, after the little introduction, I'm gonna speak now about the patent aspect of um, Sofaldi. So um, first of all, why do pharmaceutical companies patent their drug? It, it is to protect their invention against the competitors, against the imitators. Uh, there we can see that Sofosbuvir was patented by Farm Asset end of 2010 in the US. Uh, just a little side note, side note uh, because this is important for uh, Guy Lee now. In Europe and India, uh, the patent application is um, nowadays uh, challenged by a non by non-profit organizations. For instance, in France, it's Médecins du Monde. Um, now I'm going to pass the parole to Meiji. And we can see uh, why it cost her uh, 84,000 treatment for the Savaldi. Actually, I think uh, every company has the obligation to uh, their shareholders to maximize the profit and the most profit they make and they will get more investment in the future. And for the pharmaceutical industry, it is very important because uh, there is a very high investment in R&D for the pharmaceutical industry and the, um, the guy lead will, uh, will have 2 million, 2 billion on the R&D cost over 10 years and uh, the developing cost roughly is uh, 1 billion. And uh, it, it, another thing is that uh, is there is a 80% uh, project dropped out one year. So it is a very high cost in the R&D investment. And another thing is the uh, secure future project. And uh, the, Jali, the, um, the expertise for the Jali is uh, HIV, HCV, and the, home, uh, and the hematology. And the hematology is a branch of the medicines which concentrate on the study, treatment, and the prevention of the bloody diseases. And Jali knows of profit. Uh, in 2011, they acquired the from asset. Uh, it's a biotechnology company. The cost, uh, the cost uh, is 11.2 billion um, for Jali to pay in cash. And actually, we, th uh, we can see the premium on the share price amounts to um, eight, 89%. And it is, is a very huge and the risk bet on the, net, on the next generation of HCV treatment. And uh, the premium is justified because Actually, the hepatitis C medicine is more available in Jali's hand because the farm asset is just a, a small company and they have uh, invest in their development on the treatment but they can't put the market very well and very soon in, um, and to make it possible to the uh, patient. So, um, Gali do, did it. And for the pricing strategy, actually the firm asset has calculated a very um, profitable price, about um, three, three, uh, 36, sorry, six, uh, 36 thousand for the whole treatment. And then when the general had the acquisition of the firm asset, the cost has reduced to 84 thousand for the whole treatment. So, is it, is it right to put the value on this uh, product? Actually, the value is given on the market for, uh, by the JLA is no side uh, effects and uh, it, it active cure rate over 90% and also it is an oral treatment. They don't have to injection for the patient And for the benchmark, how much, for how long? 
there is a lot of expensive treatment on the market, and we can see the HIV treatment for um, for the overall lifetime is uh, two and uh, three hundred and eighty thousand, and for the HCV treatment, which we call Savaldi, is cost eighty four thousand, just about twelve weeks. Actually, for the uh, insurance company and for the med Medicaid um, system, it's hard to uh, pay the money in two, 12 weeks about the uh, about the 84,000. So in the U.S., we have established a system to reimbursement for pharmaceuticals that unfortunately puts absolutely no limits on the price that companies can charge. And then, we can see the discrimination. Actually, Jali uh, used the tiered pricing strategy on, uh, to decide their price on the market. And the, the price model, yes, based on the country's ability to pay. So we can see in the US is the highest price in the world is cost 84,000. And in Canada, just 55,000 for the whole treatment. And for Egypt, we can see just $900. And uh, uh, it's, it looks like a very reasonable pricing strategy for the patient, but why? A lot of patients can't afford this uh, highest treatment, high, uh, very high treatment. And my and Johnson, Jason will tell you in the next part. Thank you, Lee. So as I mentioned before, uh, the most of the patients currently living in the United States who are infected with the hepatitis C are come from the uh, low-income family. And uh, because of the high price of the whole treatment, which is uh, 84,000 US dollars, Sovati has a low accessibility due to being the second expensive drug introduction. So here's the ethical path. Uh, in the year of 2004, Gali, the, they started to develop this new treatment. And the, mo the major ingredient of the treatment is sulfospuvir. So in the, in the year of 2011, they acquired another pharmaceutical company, which is called Pharmaset. Uh, they spent uh, 11.2 billion on this acquisition. And in the year of 2014, uh, Gali has a different uh, pricing strategy for different countries. Like in here in the United States, the whole treatment is 84,000 US dollars. But in Canada, the whole treatment is only 65,000 US dollars. And also in Egypt, which is African country, the whole treatment is only 900 euros. And uh, in the year of uh, 2014, the Senate requests transparency, which means they require the company to provide the exact number that is spent in the research and the development process. And in the year of 2015, uh, Gali had class action suit, which means because of, because of the high price, they receive criticism from the public, and the people are arguing about the prices currently. So the ethical question. Um, a new liver transplantation costs 600,000 US dollars, but the whole treatment for Savaldi is 84,000 US dollars, but it is still cheaper than a new liver. So uh, I'm gonna pass to my uh, colleague, Julian. So as this slide shows, Sovaldi is cheaper than a new liver, but is Sovaldi's value overpriced? Do they ask too much money for the treatment that Sovaldi cures? Yeah. Um, the, US, the US Senate had some questions about this pricing uh, issue. Um, they uh, wrote some questions about the business model. It, they stated that the business model of, of Guy Lee had to be competitive, but fair and transparent and the price setting method must be efficient and rational. 
So um, next slide. This shows you the FDA approval uh, process. I won't uh, go through the whole process. Um, as my colleague mentioned before, Gaili acquired a company called Farm Asset that had the uh, active ingredient of Sovaldi in his possession. Um, this uh, active ingredient was in phase three of the clinical uh, testing, as you can see on the slide. We start with uh, the first phase, preclinical pre testing. Then the second phase is phase one to three clinical tests. So Pharmacet had this active ingredient in the last uh, clinical testing phase. Um, so Valdi was FDA approved as an investigational medicine in over 40 countries in the world uh, at the end, so in December of 2013. Um, as my colleague mentioned before as well, there is uh, a class action against uh, Gaia Lead for the pricing methods of uh, Sofaldi. What are the claims of the plaintiffs in this, actually who are the plaintiffs in this case? It's SEPTA, Southeastern, um, Southeastern Pennsylvania Transportation Agency and uh, John and Jane Doe Anonymous. Um, they uh, claim that um, Sovaldi uh, inflicts the bankruptcy of medic aid in the US due to its high price. Uh, they also state that, or claim, that the holder of the patent of Sovaldi shouldn't price gouge its consumers, um, or don't have the right to price gouge, price gouge consumers. And they also state that Gaili discriminates US patients uh, towards patients abroad because of the high difference in prices of the treatment. Um, in Gaili's defense, they say that uh, the groundbreaking new therapy of, uh, of uh, Sovaldi uh, will change the landscape of HCV treatments um, it, for the next years all around the world. Um, and there can be no discrimination if they are the same price to the same consumers in the US market, which they do. Now I'm going to pass the parole to Nina. Well, as I am the industry expert, I can give you the ethical perspective of the industry and of the government. As we all know, nobody has a right to own an iPhone, but somehow everybody thinks has a right to healthcare. Well, that sounds pretty solid, but what do we actually think? Well, the government actually wants to give incentives to drug companies to make an innovation on the market. And how do they do it? They give them a patent for 15 years, basically saying, we give you the monopoly to price the drug you discover. That sounds pretty fair. And um, the industry justifies drug prices by innovations and value rather than manufacturing costs. Because you, as I said, you spend millions, hundreds of millions of dollars on researching that drug. So you can't really put a price tag on a manufacturing cost, but you have to bring in the research and development cost as well. So the government acknowledged that. So what about our industry? Well, by protecting your intellectual property, um, people actually think of you as a vampire who sucks out the blood of the suffering patients and ignoring the poor countries. Um, so Jalid has been asked to make your pricing strategy more transparent, which I don't think is a problem here. Because as we know, uh, research and development is pretty costly. I can give you a number of 50 billion US dollars in 2013 were spent by the biggest companies, like pharmaceutical companies in the US only on research and development. And Jali is spending 2 billion US dollars every year on their researching new products. Um, but we can argue that Every HCV patient around the world, no matter if he's suffering in Egypt or suffering in Germany or even in the US, is eligible to a treatment because we have the curement in our hands. So we need to find a way, a distribution to get all of the patients around the world to that treatment. So let's wrap up with the recommendations coming in my lovely colleague. Thank you. So uh, first of all, um, Gaelid is a business that um, makes curements for a disease called HCV. This um, this curement is is a break is, is is a break in the landscape in the current landscape of HCV treatments. Um, as this has been said, uh, we would recommend 
um, for Gaili to include economic, uh, social and environmental um, uh, aspects of um, the situation uh, as well as the stakeholders and uh, shareholders uh, concerns together. Um, next to this, Galib owes a duty to the persons or um, entities that are inflicted by um, their actions and we think that the, um, those two duties are equally important. Um, for this, we should uh, we would recommend Gali to um, uh, be more active in the in their role with the IFPMA. Uh, it's the International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturers and Associations, um, as well as um, pay more attention to the education of their consumers. Um, show what they're doing uh, to save people by um, by researching and developing new treatments. Um, Next, uh, the next recommendation um, would be, um, as Nina said, more transparency in how they price their drugs, in what they're doing in their everyday uh, actions, um, because they are saving lives with, lives with the treatment they uh, make. Um, and as Nina, as my colleague said, uh, this transparency is, is very easy to do, it's very easy to give, but there is a competitive advantage that could rise when being too much transparent. So there has to be um, a method on being transparent without sharing their competitive advantage to their competitors, to the imitators. Uh, the last recommendation we would give is um, we see that HCV hits mostly the low income um, group in the US. Um, Gaili uses a tiered pricing strategy which uses the average GDP of the US. We see that um, this, uh, this uh, benchmark of the GDP is uh, way above the income of the, of the income groups that are usually hit by HCV. So we would um, recommend them to um, uh, base their price on the abilities of the groups that are usually or mostly hit by the HCV disease. But as well, we should recommend that they um, keep in mind how much cost of R&D, for example, they have spent on the treatment that they have made. Because Gaili is a company, and as a business, they save people by making treatments. So we don't want them to endanger future life-saving treatments, developments or research by selling a, a, a highly valuable drug uh, underpriced. So those are uh, the recommendations we, should, we would give to you as a board of Gaili. Thank you. I can see that we are paying uh, Naoma Consulting far too much money for these recommendations, and I would like to go back to your ethical concerns. Um, I detected a certain racist attitude here that I happen to believe that an Egyptian life is worth as much as a Canadian life or a USA life. So I think we should raise the price worldwide for everybody to the $84,000 per pill for treatment, rather, for the uh, medication. That'll, that will enable us, first of all, to pay your consulting fees, but it will also send a message worldwide that we value every life, no matter where people live. And I'm going to make that recommendation to the board. On an ethical basis, will you support us? No, absolutely not. I think it's highly unethical to give every country the same price for that. You know that US is the richest country in the world. They have actually the money to spend. Not everyone, I'm talking about the average. We have an average income of 80,000 a year in the US, and Egypt is not even one third of that. So making um, a tiered price strategy um, for um, making more accessibility for the um, people who live in poorer countries than the US. It's a pretty common strategy for the pharmaceutical industry because they acknowledge already um, that not everybody has the same money to spend on it. It's actually the tiered pricing is the most ethical stage we can find in Jaipi, making sure that everyone around the world is 
able to access those drugs. And, okay, so I give you Egypt, actually, we have a different strategy over there, not only because you said, okay, everybody in Egypt is eligible for that, but we have government, governments coming in with restrictions. We have, like, we have a stronger government in Egypt than we have in, um, in the US in terms of restricting, restricting drug prices. Let me compliment my colleague. Um, in this question, I think, um, first of all, every, every life all over the world is valued the same. But I think this question um, is, a, is a little uh, bending the corner um, too, too much because it's not about the value of a life, it's about the accessibility of the treatment. Because every person should be able to, to have access to the treatment. And to have access to the treatment, as there is a price on the drug, people need to uh, pay this price. And um, uh, this price cannot be the same in every country. So there will be differences in price in, the, in uh, all the countries around the world. I guess I'm still just a little unclear about, so currently we have this tiered price strategy. And you're, as a consultant, you're consulting that we should have a tiered price strategy. No, we're uh, recommending that they should uh, pay more attention to the um, to the income group in the U.S. that is suffering the most from this H HCV uh, disease, and together with um, the Healthcare Act, the insurance companies, and the um, cost of R&D because it's a business, we uh, would recommend them to find um, a price that is suitable for either patients, either the business, uh, the insurance companies, healthcare act, for, uh, for all the actors in this situation. So basically, you're, so we're going to have this tiered model that is just going to have more tiers for across the, the United States socioeconomic um, status. So, but are we essentially going to get to a point where we're saying, well, you don't make any money, so we're going to give you our pill for $1, whereas everyone else is going to get it for $1,000? How are we going to make money if we are going to just let everybody pay with as little as they can afford? That's when the insurance companies uh, get into the story. Because, uh, um, nowadays, there is a big reform going on, I think. Um, so, uh, there is a bit... Uh, Gaili uh, should have a um, uh, big relation or um, uh, intensive relation with insurance companies, with the policy makers, uh, to see how um, they can uh, ask the price as a business, but still the, co uh, the consumers can pay it uh, with the help of the insurance companies. So that's a win-win for both uh, of the parties, because then the business can um, uh, will not endanger the future life-saving treatments they are researching and developing right now, and the, um, the patients that suffer from the HCV disease will have the treatment they, they need and deserve. Have you given any consideration to the uninsured? Uninsured? The uninsured? Well, this is... Um, yeah, Jadid already has a patient affordable plan, so making sure that you can actually apply um, if you're uninsured to Jalid um, to, to pay your medications. But there is a problem in it because they say eligible patients. So where do you make the cut? Who is eligible to that? We think everyone is eligible to that. And since we know that the healthcare plan is currently in a huge change with Medicare and Medicaid coming in and ensuring 100 million people in the US, we think we should have stronger relations with them than with the people um, and getting into a price discussion with the Medicaid and Medicare. Because as we can already see, um, So Medicare is strictly prohibited to negotiate and Medicaid we already grant them with a discount um, of 23% and even like for prisoners they get a discount for 44% which you can still afford. We are not talking about profitability here. 
we are talking about that we are giving discounts and we are making our or your relationship with insurance company, which will have a bigger role in the future in the US because they are coming, that's for sure. We want to stretch this relationship with them, get directly into them without the lobbying. So if I'm poor and I have hep C, I should go to prison. That's right now. <laughs> you should go. And that's and you get meals. <laughs> only with HCV, that's with any drug on the market. If you're poor and you're not insured, you go better if you convict a crime and go to prison than suffering. But this is not our problem or not your problem. This is a problem of the government. So we have to distinguish here. You can't save the world. The government has to make some regulations, which, or probably not regulations, have to solve that problem. I'm still not clear how the, the, the uh, minority of people who have the highest rate of Hep C are being considered in all of this. You said that um, the average American makes $80,000 a year. Um, so the minority group is clearly clearly under that clearly under that, that, that radar. So how do you protect, what, what are the safeguards in terms of discrimination for that group? Because they already they already have the odds stacked against them. They don't make the money. They probably don't have insurance. It may or may not speak English. It may or may not. Yeah, it may have language barriers. So I, I still don't. I don't understand what the safeguards are around. What's what's the what's the ethics in terms of that? Okay. So as we already stated, um, no matter where you're from, you should get the treatment. And. Um, uh, as, as Nina said before, uh, Gailin has a program which um, which offers the treatment or, or um, m will make it more accessible to the patients that are in that uh, category or in, the, in in those group. Um, so this is one of the one of the um, uh, actions that is taken care of. And um, as I said before, I think Gailin should have more. Um, direct interactions with insurance companies, um, but as Nina said before, we as Galit cannot, or you as Galit cannot save the world. So um, uh, we um, we don't try to discriminate. We don't want to discriminate. Sorry, um, but we cannot save the world. We will um, we will uh, do everything. Um, we can to make it more accessible to those people, um, but as um, we, we don't want to endanger future life-saving treatments. Have you given any consideration to whether or not versus an application program, which probably, whether it's intentional or not, does discriminate against the, the segment of population we were just discussing? Because you, you've got to have certain resources in place to identify that the program exists, complete the application, and it also puts the company in the position of, of judgment. You, your application's good, your application's not, you get the drug, you don't. Have you given any consideration to maybe the, the cost of that program instead being put into some sort of a distribution program that puts the hand the, the medic access to the medication in the hands of medical providers? Yes, we have considered it and we came up that um, we should stay with the program because actually that program gives you a better image. And we are talking here not only about accessibility for drugs, we are talking about your image because you are in the hot seat right now when it comes to uh, the Senate, the public, and you have a very bad image right now. So we don't want to endanger this image any further by you withholding a life-saving treatments but, but how are we, I, 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 I'd be interested to pursue that image issue. So if we have a better image now because we have an application program that will allow anyone to apply to us to get the drug, why is that better than us being able to do this whole great marketing campaign that says we're going to take a certain percentage of our drugs, we're going to put them in the hands of medical providers that, that are identified as, as serving certain populations who don't typically get access. I would think we'd get a lot more mileage out of that. Mm -hmm. 
one of our recommendations was, as, um, as you can see the logo, the IFPMA. Um, within the IFPMA, the um, uh, GALI can, can uh, make a lot of um, uh, partnerships with other um, actors within the IFPMA and they can um, set up some kind of marketing strategy, as you said before, um, which allows all of this to, to happen. So I think the being more active in the IFPMA will make this happen. John, I have a question for you. I think that these men signed Dumont are criminals. They're stealing our intellectual property. What should we do about that? Can you give me a second? stealing first of all because um, they are fighting for um, the rights of the, the minority groups of those who cannot afford the drug so it's not stealing it's um, it's more uh, protecting the minority groups because if, if they would steal our drugs it would mean that they would have a patent which they don't um, so they're pressuring us to, um, to find uh, solutions to more to make this treatment more accessible to those minority groups that cannot afford the drugs. Yeah, but the next step is they're going to take it to a place that has a lot of really smart people, like India, people who know how to duplicate pharmaceutical products, and they'll make them in India and they'll sell it for fifty cents. There is current. Uh, there are some um, talks between Gali and the Indian government. Um, because there was a patent of a generic um, drug uh, for India, but India refused the patent of the generic drug. Uh, so they are um, now on speaking terms with the Indian government to provide the Indian uh, population with a generic um, drug. May I give you a recommendation on that directly? Please. That's why we're paying. <laughs> okay, so as we have seen, you all know the company Mac. It's a different company, but it's pretty big. And they had a treatment in the 80s for against river blindness. It's a treatment um, which actually affected a lot of Amer uh, not Americans, Africans. And after they retained the profit within a few years, because they were, they were holding the patent and the only treatment against it, they gave the drug out for free to all the third world com uh, countries which led to two things. Very good public um, a PR, very good um, PR, and um, they had like a huge jump in market capitalization in the 80s because of that. Um, like the PR actually led that people were seeing uh, America as a better company and more willing to invest in them because they were not only treating the shareholders with the profit, they were actually treating the ones who needed the, the drug the most. They had a pretty good CSR image, and they still have. Was that point in contradiction to what we just discussed about giving the drug out? And didn't you say that you don't recommend that we do that? No, we don't recommend this for the, the U.S. We, um, oh, you so so you were answering my question in just U.S. exclusive. So I'll just get I'm on an sure airplane and fly to Egypt? Yeah. No, because yes, that's not possible because you have to prove that you're an Egyptian resident. If you want to get the drug over there, you have to get the proof. So I'll rent the flat in Cairo. 
uh, sorry, residency plus national. And there's no uh, drug market over there? There's no black market? Of course there is, but we cannot control the black markets everywhere. And I would not recommend that because it's not safe. You will probably, even though Sovali has no side effects, the black market and the pill from the black, black market will help. So the Mark their PR move of completely giving it for free, you don't think we could benefit from that or just not in the United States? Not in the United States. Because we have actually a major market, like the major markets combined 12 million people. And that is basically US, Canada, and Europe. There is where you make your profit. But actually, the people who need the drug the most are not in this market. The other 150 or 140 million are living in Central Asia and North Africa. And they are the poorest of the poorest. So giving out the drug after retaining your profit, uh, your, your, um, your expenses within your major market of 12 million people. You can give the drug away for free, what you're basically already doing with the 900 treatment in Egypt, um, or can even go lower to make sure that everybody in the poorest country have the access for it. And you can use that um, strategy to educate your people in the US saying, okay, you are the richest country here, and you make sure not only that um, that we that there is a treatment on the market, but you actually make sure that people out there in the world who are not as lucky as we are get the treatment as well. But so the person who um, is deciding that they're going to not go to prison and they're instead going to try and afford this drug outside of prison, but still they they're not rich, but they're living in the United States. We're going to tell them that they are well off enough that they can make this drug available for everyone else in the world? That's kind of a regulation or government problem as well, because the government is only giving out those treatments right now for the sickest of the sickest Americans when they're having HCV. Basically, it's almost too late for them to, the, the next stage would be the liver transplant, and um, they get described this drug. So um, we want to get into the good relationship with the insurance company, or we want you to get into a good relationship to the insurance company, so that they actually make sure that you will give and um, that they will give out the treatment earlier, so that um, we can actually assure that the medical expenses um, for will not rise as much in the future as they will do now. By treating um, someone with 84,000 today within the next 12 weeks and curing them with a 90% um, chance. And if he is cured, he will never need another treatment for HCV again. That you know, I have an idea as you, as you talk. You mentioned the problem um, in Europe. And that's the first time we've heard Europe introduced this. And I, I believe that there are some countries that actually where it's actually legal to take intravenous drugs. Why don't we hire you to create a, a marketing, an advertising campaign for the governments of, what's that country in, in Europe? Belgium, I think it is, somewhere in Germany, is that right? That's what somebody said last night. Um, to stop intravenous drug use. Problem solved. No drug users, no hepatitis C. Okay, now you're discriminating people again. Because, um, well, you could actually be a teenager, be stupid, and use the drug, and you get hepatitis C. And um, if you start doing that campaign, you might consider uh, saying, okay, yeah, baby boomers out now. Because they are, they are the second biggest group of um, potential victims of HCV. And um, it's... It's, it's, I think you're running the danger of discriminating people again. Stop using drugs. It's, 
you would say like for a different treatment, for instance, for uh, diabetes, diabetes, you would say, okay, stop eating cake. Because it's actually the same thing. Both are, both diseases or both um, um, treatments um, were chosen by the patient before. Either if you interject drugs into your veins or if you eat a lot of cake, a lot of sugar, it's the same outcome, you're sick afterwards. So where do you make the cut? Where do you say, okay, I have to uh, protect the people from smoking, from eating, from using drugs? Good idea. Where's the life quality in that? I'm not saying about using drugs, <laughs> but you can cut um, the freedom of the people in that drastic way. Okay, we have time for one more question from the, jet, from the, uh, the board. No? Take a deep breath, guys. You're done. <laughs> Thank you. This, that was hard. Uh, and I congratulate all of you. I was, as you were speaking, I was imagining myself. I speak fluent Portuguese and Spanish. I could not do that presentation in Portuguese or Spanish. So, well done. So, really good job. Um, this is hard stuff. And, and you, you, you took on a challenging issue. And you did well. Seriously, your system, your insurance system in the US is so much more complicated than in Germany and we have actually a pretty good one. And this one is actually pretty under not understandable for anyone. It's insane. Right? It's insane. Yeah. But this, with the new but laws just coming one, in. Just one, one thought for a minute. We have somebody from Prudential on the board. <laughs> 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 but you're not going to defend our system. <laughs> um, one thing I just uh, be aware of, especially for the two of us, we're sitting right in front of you. Um, be aware that we are, you are always in our line of vision. So there were some times when you were kind of looking a little spaced out or something like that. Just because you're not the one talking, we can't still see you. So <laughs> just remember that. I think you did a really good job. Um, it's, it's a tough topic. Um, it's one that brings a lot of emotion and passion <clears throat> with it. So I think you, you did a really good job. I would uh, concur with your comments about your whole team um, staying connected and, and supportive of each other. Just because you passed the baton, you're really all in this together. So I, I agree with that comment. But I think you did a good job. Yeah, it, it's an extremely complex issue, and probably the issues around these types of subjects are the, are the most complicated to, to, you know, for anybody to get to a satisfactory place, because there, there's always some group that's, that's going to be left out. I did have a hard time following the argument. I, I, it, it took me a while to figure out exactly what it was we were just going to discuss at the end. Um, so, so just in terms of sort of the, the, the linear arrangement of your slides and kind of how you approached each topic could have been a little clearer. Um, we did figure it out in the end through, through your comments and whatnot, but I think, I think it could have been presented a little better in terms of helping us sort of follow along as we go, oh, okay, I, I exactly know what the issue here, and I, and I, I get the end, where you're trying to go at the end. I, I, would, I would agree with that. It wasn't clearly, it wasn't as organized in the, in the presentation, but through your comments, it became mm -hmm. more clear. Um, I, I think you have to be organized in your, in your presentation, but I was relieved that you were able to bring us, you know, bring us along and answer the questions. So that helped a lot. There, there are three general rules for giving any kind of presentation. Um, one is tell the audience what you're going to tell them then tell them, and then tell them what you told them. So give us a preview, tell us what it's about, and then at the end remind us what you told us. It's a good way to wrap the package. And I, I just, I have one more piece of feedback. So, I, and I don't know your name. Um, Nina? No, the gentleman, third gentleman. So, John. John. J-I-N-G. So when he was asked the question and couldn't answer it, I felt like you gave him too much, there was too much space. Somebody should have jumped in 
or could have jumped in uh, uh, immediately. So once you, about five or six seconds in, I was thinking, go, somebody go. <laughs> and so um, I, I would have liked to have seen somebody come in to, to the rescue a little bit sooner. Yeah. And there's no shame. We've all had to do it as yeah. professionals in front of really yes. important audiences. It's okay to say, you know, I don't have that answer right now. And don't be ashamed to, to say that. Better to do that than make something up on the fly. I mean, we ask you hard questions because it's a hard subject. So, good job, guys. Thank you. 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 Thank you.